Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Yao. Leadership is harder than it looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into the great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Hey, Alex, good to have you on board. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to share because I think you have a really sharp eye, not just on the VC world between the West and the emerging economies, but also the flow of ideas, talent, and inspiration. And I'm so excited to dive deep into that. Well, I'm excited to have the conversation with you. So uh, thank you. You know, so for those who don't know you yet, how would you describe your journey so far professionally? My work has always been at the intersection of questions of innovation, investing, and impact. So when I was in undergrad, I thought I would do a PhD in developmental economics. And I grew up in the middle of Canada, a small city called Winnipeg. And one of my mentors at the time had suggested that I go and get some practical work experience and uh, ended up, instead of going to academia, working on the Wall Street of Canada, Bay Street and investment banking, and realized that I love the tool of finance, wasn't in love with selling big Canadian insurance companies, but I, I thought that was an incredible tool to drive impact. I ended up instead doing my MBA and came out of that. This was during the time of the rise of impact investing and microfinance and all, all of those things. I, and that got me down this path of thinking about how finance could drive impact in those new ways. And by a long and circuitous path, I ended up doing exactly that. I had to realize that I had no discernible skills coming out of my MBA. And so I wanted to, uh, one, have some experience working. A lot of the industries I care about, like financial services, are, are highly regulated. I want to understand that. So I ended up working with the Canadian Central Bank and, and later on in consulting across a bunch of different emerging markets to, to broaden that experience. And, and then after that, I ended up in venture, first at Omidyar Network and uh, now at Cathay Innovation. And so that's been a little bit of the path of how I've, how I've gone and lucky to have discovered a job and, and, and a calling that, that I just really enjoy and resonate with and, and love every day. Amazing. And I'm just kind of curious, obviously, you know, you were in consulting at one point and then you went into VC, right? So what was the transition point there? Like, did you just wake up one morning and you were like, I love venture capital or what happened there? I think it was a little bit of a evolution of my thinking over time. So when I came out of the MBA, I had this hypothesis that I wanted to do investing, but that I really wasn't in a position to do it. I didn't know about any industries. I wanted to learn the regulatory side. And so the plan had always been going into not necessarily venture, but certainly a question of investing as the tool. When I was at McKinsey, I loved consulting. It had been just a really great experience. I didn't like the idea of becoming a partner at the firm. It just wasn't what I wanted to do, but I had really liked it. But there was a point where I felt this is an interesting exit point to do it. And I actually had a pretty structured process about discovering where I might land by speaking and building a network across a bunch of different people and trying to discover what were ideas and themes I liked and what were investors that were doing it. So it wasn't a wake up one day, it was more building relationships over time. And then one day, one of those relationships actively looking for someone junior to join their team and that, you know, being very lucky to have been given that opportunity that then brought me there. So it was much more kind of opportunity driven than it was. <laughs> than it was anything else, but uh, but it had always been a little bit of the plan going in. Right. And I think what's interesting, of course, as a being consultant who's transitioned to technology as an operator and founder and now also in VC, I kind of resonate with that. I mean, it's a kind of curious though. It's like you not only chose to transition and explore VC, but you actually chose to double down on VC, right? So, you know, you had one VC and then after that, you went on to join Cathay and double down on it. So what was that choice there? Because from there, you could have gone in to become an operator. You could have did different ways to be part of the ecosystem. Like that was the real confirmation point, right? It's not whether you want to be a VC, it's whether you continue being a VC, which is similar to consulting, I guess, right? It's not about whether you want to be a partner, it's whether you continue being a, a consultant to get promoted to partner. So I'll start by saying that I have no discernible skills. And so I, I'm not qualified to be an operator. But uh, no, to be honest, I have a very good fortune of loving my job and the opportunity to work for and alongside founders that are trying to tackle some of the biggest and thorniest problems. 
And also kind of on the side, I teach entrepreneurship. I, I just wrote this book. And a lot of that kind of has this nice little Venn diagram where a lot of these activities reinforce each other. And so I come from that lens of really liking it. But a little bit like every path in my career being being driven by relationships and serendipity. And this is another example. So I've been at Omidyar Network. It's the family office and venture fund of Pierre and Pamela Omidyar. Pierre's the founder of eBay. eBay later bought PayPal. It's really at the nexus of a lot of the things I care about. I was investing in Southeast Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the US around questions of fintech. And one of the investments I had made when I was there was in Chime Bank, which has now become kind of one of the big digital banks in the US. And Cathay Innovation, the fund had led the Series B. So I got to know them. And as a French Canadian doing global tech, it was pretty fun to meet a French fund doing global tech. And uh, they'd asked me to join and, and help grow some of our work on the West Coast. And it was really driven by the fact that they had a global platform or thinking about tech the same way I was doing it, but also an affinity towards the team that got me really excited about the opportunity and, and why I jumped in. Mm, interesting. And what do you think were the things that you had to learn, right? So it's a different form of leadership, right? It's not a classic leadership. We've worked at McKinsey at Bain, we've worked alongside CEOs of very prototypical leadership skills, which is be able to do a town hall, right? Communicate, frontline. And then as a consultant, we've always on the side or in the wings, helping them, coaching them. So I think there's a little bit of that support role, right? And I think VC has some of that flavor as well. So I'm just kind of curious how you see leadership styles being different from the classic uh, CEO type energy versus the VC side. I'll say, because you mentioned consulting, maybe I'll give you three points. But three things that I learned about, about how to be helpful to people, how to build relationships, and hopefully also grow your own career. One is around thoughtful relationships. It's been something that has really moved me. I grew up in a small town. I literally didn't know a single venture capitalist or frankly, a technologist or, or entrepreneur in kind of the technology world of entrepreneurship. And one of the things that's been really like a gift, an opportunity for me is the opportunity to build relationships with a bunch of folks. And that was how I got into a mini art network, trying to meet every VC that was kind of around those themes. And by doing that, also thinking about ways that I might be able to help them out. And similarly, I think that's the attitude I'm trying to take when I work with entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurs. And so I think this, it isn't about networking. I think it's really about building relationships and less is more, less people, but more, more depth to that. I think, I think goes a long way. Um, so I think that's one bit of it. I think the other is, and, and this is a dynamic that's becoming really acute for the best entrepreneurs in the most active sectors is actually depth is really important. And so some VCs bring deep operating knowledge. You know, Jeremy, you've been a founder before, but I think that the depth you can bring can be a diff bunch of different things. The lens that I've tried to take is this combination of having a little bit of this global aperture by working across a bunch of different geographies and a pretty deep focus on one or two industries for me, financial services and healthcare is where I spend most of my time and, and to try to be pretty helpful in a little bit of a deep way. And, and I think that has served me, that has served me well. And then the third thing that I think is really valuable, which is going to sound counter to the depth point, is actually a little bit of taking a multi-sector lens. I think that we have a tendency, and I live in San Francisco, where we think of technology a little bit as this panacea that can solve all of the world's problems. And the reality is that's not true, and big businesses will succeed within an ecosystem of government policy and regulation, of corporates that might be supporters of the startup within their ecosystem, of kind of a, a wide range of partners in it. And I think that having a little bit of this lens is something that's great for any leader that's emerging, is, is taking not just a deep functional of understanding your industry and your problem, but also a little bit of a multi-sector lens, see how other people might think about it and, and how you are acting within a system. Amazing. Let's get deeper on that, right? So. I think what you said about thoughtful and depth and this multi-sector, they're all intertwined. And I think you're right to say that it does sound kind of paradoxical uh, from that perspective. So let's examine the linkages of that, right? So obviously to have a thoughtful relationship, you need a value and you have to know what you know and what you don't know, right? Can we talk a little bit like, what are VCs good for, right? You know, <laughs> you know like, <laughs> I mean, they bring the money, obviously, they're on the board. So what's the value, I guess, in the depth? So one is like industry, you mentioned the scanning, but I guess for founders out there, as well as I guess new VCs thinking about how to bring, show their value or be clear about where their value isn't there. Like what are the major parameters that 
people should consult VCs for and should not consult VCs for. <laughs> <laughs> I think the point you started with is really crucial, which is knowing what you don't know. And I think that VCs will add value in different ways. And I think it should be authentic to who they are. And founders should select who they choose to partner based on where that per particular person might be able to help in tandem with the money and a bunch of other factors. But I actually think that piece is important. I think, for instance, having folks that are operator VCs can be really helpful as having a peer or someone that can talk through some of the challenges that won't be the exact same situation. I think there's some ubiquity there. But I actually think that, and this is obviously a little bit self-serving, that other VCs that are not operators can also add value in different ways. But it's really knowing where you as an individual can act. Like I shouldn't be giving very direct prescriptive operating advice to any founder because I don't come with that lens. And, and frankly, I don't think any VC should come with, with that, with, with prescriptive, very specific, but definitely not me. Like that isn't where I, I can add, but I do know the lanes where I, I think I know something about something. But I also think it's just really important to know that context is always different. The founder is the one that's closest to the problem full time. I'm there kind of as a cheerleader, a helper, a networker, a lot of BD, all these things, but I don't know the problem as deeply as the person who I partner with and I partner with because in part, how well they know the problem. And so I think keeping that humility of that as well is critical, but I'd say it's really important to know what you don't know and, and know where you think you can be most helpful and lean in as hard as you can there as well. Yeah, that's so true. I think knowing what you don't know and being articulate about that with your partner, I think it reminds me a lot of like strong teams, right? I think so many founders I've met honestly look at this as like... <laughs> an adversarial contact spot you know, where, you know, it's like the VCs on one end and you got to figure out how to like approach and be in a plan of attack. And there's a lot of adversarial component and that's useful in some frames, I think in terms of mobilizing to figure out how to fundraise, but not so useful when things about how to pick the right VC that is actually the best team with you. Of course, not every founder has the ability to pick multiple VCs or have a choice, right? I was just going to make one, one little point reaction to that because I really agree with it. The first is, I think when you select the board that you're coming with, I think it's important to understand where your particular board is adding value or where your whole cap table is adding value in different ways. And think about it as a little bit of this Venn diagram of where are their gaps. And for this round of funding, I'm at Series B, I'm going to Series B, like wh where are the special, and those gaps will change and they'll evolve as the company scales, but where are those gaps right now, I think that's a pretty important lens to keep in mind because it is a team. And I don't think, you know, when done really well, I don't think it's an adversarial thing at all. I actually think you're all on the same team, uh, hopefully over the long term, right? The average venture relationship is longer than the average American marriage. So you need to be really sure. <laughs> uh, that's a great comparison. I got to remember that. <laughs> so I think there's a huge amount of truth there. And of course, I think the reality of course is that and I think founders are going to be scared, right? I mean, obviously they're pitching and everything. And then they walk into this team with Alex, right? You know, for VC, right? And you know, it's hard to be authentic or real, show your true leadership. So I guess what tips would you have in, in that leadership development or partnership as between the VC and the founder, right? I'll say, you know, maybe harkening back to my comment about marriage a second ago, I think I really don't like some of the dynamic that's playing out around shotgun weddings, preemptive rounds, a lot of this. And the reason I don't like it is because the venture entrepreneurial relationship is really a relationship. You need to trust each other quite a bit. The founder needs to trust the VC and, and vice versa. And so I think one lesson is that relationships take time. You know, if I look back at the investments I've made, most of them, I've known the founder for a long time, you know, a year before I've, I've made the investment. And by the way, that makes it possible to do things like move very, very quickly on around, et cetera. But it starts on some type of foundation of having a relationship. It feels like the dynamics in venture are changing a little bit where rounds are happening way faster. And I caution that actually, I think it's worth investing in the time. And, and particularly in the Zoom context, where we might not even have shaken hands. I actually think one of the ways to navigate through that is actually spend even more time through the process to really kind of get, get to know besides just the, the couple of Zooms where it's very easy to to have one perception of someone, I think, I think you, you build that over time. So I think that's one lesson I would think about. And I think it's something I'm trying to build into the way I practice and, and I work. And so it's something I, I think in Zoom, I'm still learning <laughs> how to do and I want to be better at. 
I think there's an interesting piece, right? Because, you know, I think you're right to say like with the preemptive and all that stuff, obviously it's a way for capital competing for great founders, right? <laughs> Which is good. And people are moving faster and faster. And I think from a founder perspective, of course, it's good from a valuation and speed basis. And I think it's a balance between also having that intentionality about who you're, like you said, teaming up with for the next round or the next foreseeable future, right? You know, like you said, cap table is longer than average marriage as one. One thing that also came up to me, I think it was interesting about the word relationship was like, I think a lot of people don't see that the relationship is phased, right? Just because they're a great VC now doesn't mean they're going to be a great VC partner for you when your company makes it to the next stage, right? Then it's a new round of VCs who are better able to I don't know, nurture you to the next stage. By the way, on that, I think it's not just about the relationship with the person. There's a person who will be on your board. Like you need to have a good... We also, if I was giving advice to the founder, I would say also build a relationship with a couple of the other partners of the firm or just more broadly a lens of relationship because partners might leave, right? The partner might leave the, the firm and, and you'll be joined by someone else, right? I think you need to be comfortable primarily with the person that's sponsoring the deal, but having a really good lens of the shared values of the institution you're, you're working with, because I, I think that's critical. Oh, yeah. And no, I think that's, I know that's exactly spot on. I think you kind of answered the, the, one of the key questions, right? Which is, you know, I think you got to invest in a partner because that's the direct point of contact and you have to invest in the relationship with the firm, right? And I think that's an interesting challenge. Now, I'm just kind of curious across this journey of like leadership development, partnership, et cetera, and then your own professional development across McKinsey and, you know, VC, what professional hurdles have you faced, obstacles have you had to overcome over time? So many, but also I've had the really great fortune, uh, a lot of very great fortunes too. I think one, you know, maybe just coming back to the point on relationships, I'll just make this point and, and share one piece of advice for some of the listeners as well. You know, I, I grew up in a small town. I literally didn't know a single person that had been a venture or been in, in, a, in the industry. And I think that was tough to kind of break in. I was given my shot to join. And the way I had done it, and maybe this is advice that might help folks, is I had been interested in questions of financial services for the 99% for kind of the rest of the world as a tool for socioeconomic development and to uplift people. What I had worked on was a list of 50 people that I thought were working on really interesting things with an investing lens. So not even necessarily venture capital. I was looking at some private equity stuff. I was looking at a range of things. And even in the grant making world too, like uh, I'm just uh, working, but kind of with an innovation or, or startup lens. And one of the things that had worked was actually just trying to like target every company in a portfolio and the GPs in, in the team, et cetera. And then over time, kind of triangulating what are the things that, that really work. But over time, also by virtue of the fact that you know a bunch of the same folks in the same circles that then kind of brings a little bit of this value out that you might do to the person and, and just kind of continue. And, and so one of the things that had been really helpful for me was actually being very tactical and methodological on what are the institutions that had shared values on paper, at least you don't really know until you spend time. What are the companies that look interesting? And then with that kind of building the foundation of things, a relationship that then can open other doors to meet other folks. And so it had been probably a year of work in some ways of slowly building, building those things and taking that lens. But I, I think that was one that kind of my transition from growing up in the middle of Canada to, to kind of eventually landing in San Francisco and, and working in venture. Was it tough transitioning from, you know, middle of Canada, like small network kind of like place and feel to becoming somewhat of a networked person? Was that a tough transition, maybe an identity or practice or behavior? I think I have a, a very uh, confused identity as a starting point. So my mom is Belgian. My father's American. They met in Montreal. They're, they're doctors, so a for residency, and eventually landed in, in Winnipeg. But I always kind of felt a little bit kind of from, I, I'd had the opportunity to travel a little bit. And, and, and with three passports, I, I always felt a little bit, a little bit confused. So it was a little bit of a mix, to be honest, it was a little bit of a mix of Winnipeg, but of kind of a bunch of different other places too, uh, where I had family and, and relatives and et cetera. Interesting. Well, thanks for sharing about that. It feels like making a dotted line here, but is there a dotted line between your childhood as a you know, multicultural household and working across the world? Is that a dotted line all the way to your, you know, your book? <laughs> I think that when you talk about your career in retrospective, you can paint a very linear dotted line. I don't think, I don't, it's not the case for me. And it, I, I think it's rarely the case for anyone, but I will say the fact that I'm really interested, I thought I was going to 
a PhD in, academ in developmental economics, and I've always been interested in teaching and writing, was part of a foundation. I ended up teaching a class at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies, which is Middlebury College's graduate program. That was kind of stemmed out of that. I started writing a, a lot in, in blogs and, and publishing in a bunch of uh, platforms, uh, Forbes and others. And then those kind of things then gave me the opportunity to develop a concept for a book, which I then submitted at this contest. And by the way, full circle, the contest is called Brackenbauer after Marvin Bauer, the founder of McKinsey. It was, it's a joint prize with the Financial Times and McKinsey. And that uh, contest, I, I placed top three and it kind of launched me down the book path. And so a bunch of things that didn't appear linear but were based on a genuine interest that was you know, that is very <laughs> original, right? It's, it's something I, I really was interested in since I, since I was studying university. That kind of naturally and luckily kind of offered a bunch of stepping stones that gave me the chance to write a book. And you know, I did my MBA at Harvard and my publisher was Harvard. So it's kind of a lot of these circumstances unrelated, but kind of part of that journey as well. And so, yeah, I, I think that was how I did it. I just published this book, maybe just to complete the thought. Um, called I'll Innovate How Global Entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are Rewriting the Rules of Silicon Valley with, with, with HBR. And in some ways, talking about some of the lessons and frustrations I've had in my career from the lens of an investor in startups all over the world. And as a someone that teaches it around global innovation, it was really frustrating to me that there was no books available about what it's like to scale in tougher ecosystems around the world. There were only books that were rooted in a particular context, Silicon Valley today, and for a very particular type of asset light, software-based company that wants to scale exceedingly fast. And so to solve that problem, I interviewed about 200 founders, mostly folks leading some of the biggest startups around the world to share their lessons and their best practices, which I think taken together are uh, evolving a new playbook on Innovate. And, and mostly it was, and this is one of the things I admire about your work with the podcast, is to start a conversation, to be part of the conversation about building uh, and scaling great businesses, but also creating a community of conversation around these same issues. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, let's dive deeper into some of the themes that you explored in the book. So obviously you have many examples of how historically ideas have traveled all across the world, right? So you talk about algebra, you know, traveling from, I think uh, multiple people were helping along the way in Asia, in the Middle East, in the States and the Europe. So all kinds of different innovations and everybody contributed and helped each other build algebra and math today. So that was like one example in the book. And then you gave an example, obviously, we use the homegrown example in Southeast Asia was you talked about Gojek and how there was an Uber component in the States. I think for some people may know, obviously, there was a Harvard connection. So the Grab founder and the Gojek founder were both Harvard Business School MBAs who brought the experience of Uber in the States and brought it back to Indonesia and Singapore, respectively. And then what's interesting, like you talked about, was that there was the localization aspect of that. And after that, in some ways, it's a reverse export of it because these super apps alongside the Chinese ones are getting re-exported back to the West as ways to monetize or build the model. So I'm just kind of curious, when you talk about that, you know, I don't know what's the word, flywheel, or loop, what personally struck you? To, what, what did you find surprising when you were doing that research? I'll answer the question on that chapter specifically around cross-pollination. And then I'll give two other thoughts that surprised me as I, as I dove deeper. On cross-pollination, it's exactly as you said. One is who is generating the ideas and how. Two is how are the business models evolving and what are the inspirations. And three, how is this what I call the innovation supply chain? How is that manifesting itself? So on first on the who, one of the things that really struck me is that the best global entrepreneurs and frankly the best American entrepreneurs defy the stereotype. We often think of the 22-year-old hooded warrior working in the garage, toiling in the garage until late hours, but it's not like that, right? Most of the biggest businesses around the world, and certainly in Southeast Asia are included, are folks with some amount of work experience that have had a global experience as part of that and really deeply studied a model. In, in Silicon Valley, for instance, to, to, uh, to even put a little point on it where the stereotype is totally different, the average successful founder, folks with big exits, are 35 to 45. They tend to be immigrants, which you might argue are the ultimate cross-pollinators. And even if you think of Zuck and... Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, what's amazing about those stories, just to, to share, is that uh, if you look at the stock performance of their companies in their 20s, they are dwarfed by their stock performance when they're in their 40s. And so this long-term experience really matters, this cross-pollination of, uh, of a bunch of different experiences, 
industries, et cetera. So I, I think that's one. I think the second is where the best ideas are coming from, the inspiration. And, and like you alluded to, the best ideas are coming from everywhere. And make a point to the third one, they're improving as they as they scale. So the Gojek story, right, in some ways inspired by Uber and Lyft that emanated in the Valley, scales internationally at the same time as 99 taxis in Latam, Kareem in the Middle East. By the way, the biggest ride hailing service in the world is in China, right? So the biggest ones are actually no longer even in the Valley. And that inspired Gojek to do the super app. And by the way, it's no surprise now that Uber has the Uber credit card and Uber Eats, the fastest growing segment. So that's really how the best ideas are manifesting. And we're seeing it over and over. We're seeing it in uh, Buy Now, Pay Later, for instance, where we saw a firm and then one of the rising companies in Southeast Asia, Finixcel, uh, which happens to be a portfolio companies of ours, um, is scaling or in Europe, Alma, or you know, obviously there's a litany of these other massive big ones like, like Afterpay, et cetera. Every trend in innovation or many of the trends, particularly in consumer land or SME, are having some amount of this, this inspiration around the world. So I, I think that's a really critical idea. And I believe it's one, one of the reasons that Global trends and innovation are more critical than ever. It seemingly looks like borders are coming up. I think that's horrible because actually the way we need to innovate needs to be horizontally around the world. So that's point one. I'll also mention that I think that the best entrepreneurs around the world are solving different problems. So they are, in the book, I call them creators. They're solving things that really matter for the mass market, that are mass market from day one in industries that are generally not formalized or, or exist. So they're really building it. And Third is they're often standing on the shoulders of giants that have come before them. And so I think that's a really key insight. It looks totally different than in the Valley. In the Valley, are obsessed with disruption of creating software tools to really make an existing market more efficient. Gojek is really formalizing an entire industry and building a super app that's really, you know, a million people get their primary income from, from the platform and uh, they're offering some pretty critical services. And then the third point that I, that I mentioned in the book, which I think is a really valuable lesson that flies in the face of blitz scaling and Silicon Valley orthodoxy on how you build a business is this notion that in many emerging startup ecosystems, particularly those with less capital, end up building based on a foundation of sustainable unit economics. They, of course, grow, they're growing massively and rapidly, but they're doing it while also managing burn. They're keeping it things under control. They're keeping that long-term perspective on on building. And so in the book, I call it taking the camel approach of, of really building on these foundations. And you can still be a unicorn, right? You can still be a billion dollar business but you're building it in a different way. So I, I think that's the third point I mentioned in the book. Yeah, that's really strong. And I think, you know, sometimes I always talk about these are stuff that when you hear it, we're not utterly surprised by individually, but I think together, that's a really strong set and point of view, right? That's much stronger because we all know about unit economics. We know about that. What's interesting, I really liked about your book, of course, like I think the, the lens of the world, right? Because in the past, it used to be like, USA number one, right? <laughs> I'm just saying, right? You know, around the world, like, if it's a US idea, it's good, right? And then I think we're currently in this paradigm, which is like East versus the West, right? <laughs> which is like there's Eastern models of innovation and there's Western models of innovation, right? And I think what you're kind of talking about is like, hey, this is the everywhere model, right? It's getting stacked. It's a feedback loop. It's a dynamic loop of action rather than a static east versus west, left versus right, up or down kind of uh, approach. You know? I guess it's less catchy, I would say, because I love those east versus west, China versus America, clickbait articles. But I like that approach. Yeah. Let me try to give you a more clickbaity one, which I think is the Detroit model. Although I really do like the everywhere model. But I, this is how I predict innovation is going to unfold in the coming decades. A hundred years ago, the capital of innovation wasn't Silicon Valley and the tool wasn't software. It was Detroit and it was automobiles. And hundreds of entrepreneurs were moving to Detroit, start companies, or joined the big three. And it was really the dominant force on an innovation that we made, how we worked, where we lived, et cetera. Then what happened, right? Today, the innovation capital of automotive has moved everywhere in your way, but it hasn't moved where everyone is building great cars specialization has moved in different places. The capital of Germany might say it comes from Germany and the sexy sports cars are in Italy and the smallest cars have come from India and the capital of electrification, you might say, is San Francisco or Shenzhen. And by the way, the most reliable cars come from Japan, right? Think of Toyota and things like that. And not only did specialization globalize, so different places became the capitals of different things, but so did best practice. And I think that's critical, and that's why I wrote the book. Think of just-in-time manufacturing 
coming out of Japan and now becoming standard manufacturing practice all over the world. I think that's what's going to happen to the world of innovation. I'm not saying Silicon Valley is dead. It's very popular to say that on, on Twitter. I think Silicon Valley is going to remain a very, very important place for innovation, but it will no longer be the place. And I think places like Singapore are going to become, you know, obviously already are regional leaders where some of the biggest businesses in Southeast Asia emanated from, from Singapore. But I think that, that we're also going to see more and more global businesses come from that. We're already seeing some of those trends. I think we're going to place, see places like Estonia become capitals of e-government. We've already seen London become arguably a better place to start a fintech. Let's see post-Brexit how this unfolds, but one of the best places in the world to do a fintech business. I think that's how it's going to continue manifesting itself over time. And that's why, by the way, there's a lot of value for a Singaporean founder or VC to learn what are the best practices in other emerging ecosystems, because those will be true, but also for Silicon Valley to learn about what's working in Singapore. I think more than ever, learning the lessons of the best entrepreneurs everywhere will be critical. Amazing. I love it. I love this global bazaar, <laughs> not a marketplace, a bazaar of ideas and innovation, right? I like I think of it more as a, as a university where I, you go to university and you study economics, you can study dentistry, you can study arts. And I think it's important to just take a holistic perspective and understand that the answers on how we work, we organize our society, will not come from one lens alone. We, we need to take many, many lenses. So, but I like the bizarre, <laughs> the bizarre analogy too, because in some ways, like the, the way it's evolving is so dynamic. So I'll, let me think about that. Yeah, I love the idea of just like all the different shops, hockey new wares, right? <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> and you just kind of like, it's like way, making your way through all the founders and ideas, and inspiration and podcasts and stakeholders. Well, coming on time here, I understand you, you know, you've got that time. So love to ask you one last question before you head out, which is if you could go back in time 10 years ago, right? What advice would you give to yourself? You know, you teleport back in time. What would you say? And I think more importantly, how would you say it to yourself? I think one of the things that I often wish I had done in a little bit, I alluded to it before of kind of having this horizontal perspective is have done, having done more of that, right? I took a finance degree with international business. I wish that I had joined a degree that was maybe dual major where maybe I learned something like, which, which at the time was not purely on my radar, right? But learned basic software engineering or some, uh, something like that, or taken a lot of arts classes. And I think the way I might have told myself is most of it, most of university, what I think you learn, you can learn, like you can learn, you don't need to take all the classes, but I actually think what it's kind of this unique lens to take a little bit more of a horizontal, multi-sector, multi uh, discipline approach and just say like the rest of it will figure itself out. But actually that foundation to be able to speak a bunch of different languages turns out to be, I think more, it's the kind of thing that I think becomes more valuable the farther out you are from school. Whereas kind of the, I think a lot of the stuff I studied was very directly applicable to the first and second jobs. I wish I had taken more things that were broader basic foundations. Cause I think that ends up being really valuable. And, and by the way, a study was done around some of the founders and some of the leading founders around the world. And one of the things that struck me is the preponderance of philosophy degrees, right? Not finance, not management, right? But it's like learning the art of thinking. And so that's just kind of one example of why I think this stuff is, is important. And that's probably the, the advice I would have given myself is give yourself a break to learn the things that seem just really, really inspiring and, and, and are kind of orthogonal to what, what your major is. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I wish this podcast could be longer, uh, but... Alex, could you just share very quickly the title of your book, where they can find it, and your own, uh, I guess, social media handles? Oh, for sure. Well, um, this has been a lot of fun. I feel like the conversation flew by. So my book is How to Innovate, How Global Entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit Are Rewriting the Rules of Silicon Valley. And you can find it anywhere where books are sold. Although I would encourage you in this day and this time of COVID to buy a small bookstore or independent business to support small business. And if you'd like to follow my work, I run a newsletter, which you can register at my website, alexlazaro.com, A-L-E-X-L-A-Z-A-R-O-W. And you can follow me on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. My handle is Alex Lazaro on, on both. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a, a lot of fun. I didn't expect talking from everything about camels to uh, my childhood, but uh, <laughs> this was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, for those who want to discuss more about this, uh, we do post a transcript and then have a discussion thread on jeremyow.com. We do have a discussion thread to discuss this and highlight key insights and quotes that we liked. 
uh, and we welcome you to the community. And again, Alex, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night.